Good evening. Welcome to the service. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us today. Thank you for the warmer temperatures. Um, just thank you that we can be gathered here again tonight. And I pray your blessing on Brother Dean as he shares with us this week. Um, just give him the words to speak and give us the openness to receive what you have pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can turn in the purple songbooks to number 387. (coughs) 
387. just like to read the lyrics of this song. If you want, you can turn to it. It's number 752. At, at first I prayed for light. At first I prayed for light. Could I but see the way? How gladly, swiftly would I walk to everlasting day? And next I prayed for strength that I might tread the road with firm, unfaltering feet and win the heaven's serene abode. And then I pr asked for faith, could I but trust my God? I'd live enfolded in his peace, though foes were all abroad. 
But now I pray for love, deep love to God and man, a living love that will not fail, however dark his plan. And light and strength and faith are opening everywhere. God waited patiently until I prayed the larger prayer. Good evening and a welcome to each one that is here this evening. Evening, I greet you in the worthy name of Jesus this evening. It's what an awesome day that God has given us today. It seems you come through a winter and a day like today is just so much more precious. Enjoying every last minute of it. Um, so, yeah. Looking forward to these next several evenings, and um, I'm not sure where your thoughts are or where, what you're looking to receive out of this, but I, I trust that, um, yeah, we'll be blessed. I had to, I had to think, uh, I'd like to read um, one verse out of 1 Peter 2, 9, verse 9. You can turn to that if you want. It says, he says, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is that who we really are as a Sharon church? Is that who we are? And I had to think of, you know, oftentimes, if, if you greet the congregation, what do we say? We greet in the name of Jesus. Do we really appreciate greeting each other in the name of Jesus? There is, there is power in the name of Jesus. And we get together in the name of Jesus. There's, there's a lot more to that than I think that we fully grasp at times. So it's in that name that we meet as a church to see what Jesus truly has for his people as we strive, as that first song said, to draw nearer to him, just, just a little nearer. Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Really, what is that? I, I remember a, a devotional that I, I had read on this verse here. Couple, several years ago in the, in the Beside the Soul Waters, and the author had three S's that he wanted to point out for his people to get out of this verse. First one was, get serious. We are a chosen generation. We need to get serious about it. Second one is, become sweet. And the third one is, keep stepping. And, you know, and I think those are three valid steps as we realize who God has called us to as we get together in the name of Jesus. The, um, I was challenged here in the last several days. I listened to this song called I Speak Jesus. And I'll just read some of the lyrics. He says, I speak, I speak the name of Jesus over every heart and mind because I know that there is peace within your presence. And isn't that true? There is peace when we get together in the name of Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. And it's in that name that we gather this evening. I was in contact with Dean Taylor. Oh, I don't know when I, how long ago it's been. And but part, part, part of this cutting came out in, um, I believe it was in summer of 23 at the convention that you spoke maybe. And, you know, the Sharon Church was kind of in charge of hosting the, some of that event. And so there was a lot of us that were preoccupied and, you know, either the children or ushering or food or, you know, whatever else there was. And so Dean and Tanya, I think, both spoke um, at the convention. So some of you may have heard there are testimonies there. Some of you may not have. So um, that was part of my goal is to 
try and get them here and so all of us could truly um, hear who they are and where they came from. It was in that summer uh, when they, I believe, moved from Boston, maybe, and were next door neighbors to us, and so learned to know them uh, in a in a good way. So, um, yeah, I've been praying for. We've been, I trust we've been praying for Dean. I know I have, and uh, really looking forward to these next several evenings to um, what he has to share with us. So, I think maybe at this time, Dean, I'll ask you to come up and I'll have prayer, and then. Turn the time over to you. And then Dean, wherever you'd rather speak up there, that's fine. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just bow, bow in your precious name, God. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus this evening, God. Name above all other names, God. Father, we just uh, bring Brother Dean before you. Just ask that you just might anoint his lips, anoint our ears this evening, that we could hear rightfully, and that we could truly uh, learn to apply to our lives what uh, he has to share this evening, God. So just um, be with him, give him strength to speak, and just bless him in a mighty way. We just ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Yes. Wait a minute. I was, I was worried where you were going to go with that neighbor thing, but uh, it was fun living next to them. They had some great campfires. They have a, a fun place out there. It is great to be here. It's a shame that I, it's taken me so long. It's It's been constantly someplace that we've wanted to visit. So this has been good to drag me here like this. So this is a blessing. I, I really like to uh, get to know the local communities, and several of you are friendly faces that I recognize through Legacy and just different places. And we've just absolutely loved moving here. We live down the street at Sugar Creek, and so you're all neighbors to us, so it's a blessing. Um, so today I'm going to be talking and giving our testimony of how we came into the Anabaptist world, how we first heard of Mennonites and all that kind of a thing, and how we heard about the teachings of Jesus, which is what brought us there. Um, the, the series is going to go like this. So tonight I'll give the testimony of my wife and I of how we discovered these things. And then on tomorrow night, Lord willing, um, what I'll do is I'll just present the basic kingdom Anabaptist perspective, early church perspective, if you would, of, of two kingdoms, and I'll give that to us. And, and I'm going to really push tomorrow night on the emphasis on the very person and teaching of Jesus Christ. I think that's very important. I'm going to overdo saying that so many times tomorrow night. And then tomorrow, I mean the next day, that's Tuesday, that I'm going to talk about, well, what is the place for the state? What do you do with the government and and all these types of things. So we'll talk about that, talk about some of the Old Testament wars and, and different things, and that'll be on, on Tuesday night. And then on Wednesday, Lord willing, I will try to uh, present to you what happens when we mix the two kingdoms up. And so uh, through history, as Anabaptist people, and even before that, when, when, um, when those two kingdoms mix... It ends up messing up both, and we'll talk about that on Wednesday night, and I'm going to give you some examples that are pretty, I don't know, uh, it seems like it, pretty ex- examples that seem to be coming to us again. I, I, you know, funny, I'm looking over um, some of the, and you can start the thing there, but uh, I, as I look at some of these things that are happening, you know, in my testimony, the Cold War, I'm going to be showing you pictures of the Berlin Wall and all that kind of thing. You know, and I hear what's going on today with all Israel and, you know, Iran and all those kind of things. I'm like, wow, you know, it, it's amazing how these things just keep circling. But because of that, you're around a lot of people who are going to say, well, why do you Mennonites not do this and that? And, 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 and then, of course, the whole voting fiasco that we have ahead of us and all those things. You'll hear my opinions on all that throughout the week. Uh, don't blame your ministers. They, uh, so I didn't. Anyway, so I'll just leave that. So I'm going to tell you how I ended up, and my wife and my dear family ended up. So we live here down the street. We have six children. I have three grandchildren, and we have Tanya's mother all living in our house there, four generations living down the street. It's a very busy home, and so it's, it's lively, especially the grandkids keep us happy. So so, all right, so why don't we get into that, and I'm going to show you some of the things. Really 
shout out to, I never walked into a church and literally had my slides already up, and so that's pretty impressive. So I think I'll maybe see this better over here, and I got this little note thing, which will kind of help me. So uh, years ago, my wife and I put together a, a book of our, of our testimony called Change of Allegiance, and this, this idea of the title here is really, I don't know, puts things to, uh, in, in a words, of the way we feel that we were soldiers in the army, and then we changed our allegiance to soldiers in Christ. We don't want to be non-active anymore, passive, pacifist, or whatever things. We still believe that we should be active in the kingdom of God, but our, our, um, our allegiance has chain, changed. And that was, you know, a long time ago. That was in the 1990s when we, 1990 when we got out. And, and I think if you could sum up it all, what, what draw, drove us then, what drives us now is this question. And if I can do anything through these three days for you to get a hold of, it's this question. So what if Jesus really meant every word he said? Now, I say that because, of course, well, of course we believe he means everything he said. But what the question is intended to do for you and your friends who challenge your way of thinking is to take it seriously. We tend to spiritualize all these teachings of Jesus, and, and when these teachings have some pretty significant things that ex- are expecting for us to follow. And, you know, and as we, as we look at those things, you know, the, the idea of loving our enemies was something, of course, that's going to be the highlight of, this, of today's message. Well, maybe the whole three days, a lot of it is. And the idea is that many people say, oh, yes, we should love our neighbors. But Jesus took it further than just loving our neighbors to loving our enemies. And that idea is so radical and so different than the different religions and different things um, that are throughout the world today. Um, and also thing that, that has been a, a uh, bedrock of the faith for me, and I want it to be a bedrock of faith for you, is that the teachings that we stand on are the historic faith of the Christian church. And so, you know, in the ancient church, these teachings of Jesus were just accepted as something that would be, uh, I mean, he's the author of this. He's the, he's the one we're, we're praying to. He's the one, he's our God. And he came and he preached a message, and it was this living out the following of Jesus Christ which radically changed um, uh, everything. So here we are, 35, uh, pushing 40 years ago, um, in front of our um, uh, army base there, um, outside of it. And there's my wife with camouflage. Isn't she cute? So <laughs> she, uh, we went back with the Anabaptist history tour just a few years ago, and there we are at the same steps we stood on. So yeah, a lot of years between those and a lot of miles, but... Again, through all that, we have six beautiful children, um, and, um, and one of them is up in New York City with you guys up there um, with the, um, oh, the Shepherd's Cup. My, my daughter-in-law works and all that, and so it's been a blessing. Um, so as I, I was raised in a very patriotic home, I mean really patriotic, um, joining the Army was something that I felt I didn't just do uh, you know, grudgingly, it was something that I really believed in. It was something that I thought, you know, was, uh, I don't know, it was, it, it was, it was feeling like this, this whole idea of, of fulfilling my duty to the country. And so there's my basic training picture, and it was, it was something. Telling you the same way when she joined the army later, and I'll get into that in just a bit, when she joined the army, um, I first came in as a soldier, and we were, I was, we were both musicians, and we were going into Germany. She came over first as a civilian, and then while we were over there, she then joined the army. Um, and that was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, I don't know, significant, because she left and had to then go to basic training and advanced training and that type of a thing. We were musicians, so we were in an army band, and some of our jobs were... Um, uh, to play co- different kinds of concerts, from marching bands to jazz bands. And one of the things that then had a significant hold on us was actually in a rock band. That's what your tax dollars were doing in those days. And so we were, like, we would come and play for, you know, places where troops would come over. In those days, we were, 
kind of would have these mock uh, things of where the, the soldiers would come in for a Russian attack. It's kind of coming, <laughs> coming more pertinent again today. And there would be huge amounts of Americans that would go over there in this uh, mock war, and then we would go and play concerts for that. I, I talked into my, my wife into joining uh, later, and, and that had a significant effect because me, her joining later after me made me um, extend my stay, which then really made all this happen. In a patriotic home, I, it meant a lot to me. I remember growing up, my, we were in the South, and as we were growing up, I remember going to Confederate war sites and, and everything, and, and like, it was, I mean, it was serious to us. Like, I can remember one time when I was a little boy going to the Alamo, and, and have you ever been to the Alamo? So, okay, all right, I'm, you know, if you're a Texan, you're going to Alamo. It's, you know, it's kind of like a shrine, you know. And so we were there, and I never, when you walk in, there was a plaque on the floor, which apparently this, where it's claiming that Davy Crockett had died here. And so I, my dad called me and my brother over to this little plaque on the floor, and he said, and he kind of joking, but kind of serious, Dean, look at this. And I said, okay. And he said, this, on this spot, Davy Crockett died. And he kind of, you know, had this kind of almost joking but yet serious, you know, <laughs> patriotic look to him as he was telling me that Davy Crockett had died there. And, and that kind of thing, you know, it moved me. It, 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 it challenged me. And, and w- even today, I, I, the place that I put this sense of patriotism, this sense of nationalism, if you would, um, that's inside of me, I have to purposely then change that allegiance to this country, to Jesus Christ as king and the nation as the kingdom of God. Because I think that Jesus still uses that patriotism and that nationalism, but he doesn't want us to mix it with the kingdoms of this world. He wants us to give the allegiance to him. And so but then all that challenge, there's me uh, in basic training. There's Tanya's. Uh, we were just, just my girlfriend at the time uh, on my locker. And so again, I, I, I enjoyed all that. There's Tanya when she joined. She also comes in a, in a significant package of patriotism in a different way. Her father was a Hungarian refugee in 1956 leaving uh, when the communists and the, took over Hungary. So he lived through uh, World War II of when um, the Germans took over his town. And then after that, when they were defeated, then the Russians took over his town. And he saw both his father and his grandfather taken to Siberia. One of them died. One of them actually made, made it. Well, I guess both of them escaped. But, and he thought, okay, it's my turn I'm, yeah, I'm going to now be taken uh, also. I've got to do something. So he was part of a little resistance group and everything. And then when the Russians took over, he jumped on a train and then got off at a border, got smuggled through, ended up in Austria, which ended up in New York City, which he met a Roman Catholic priest and ended up in Dallas and then had my wonderful daughter, uh, his wonderful daughter who became my wife, and that's him. So as he then came, he would always tell them, you know, we live in the best country in the world. And I do believe we, are, we do. I've been to several different countries and, and things, and I do love America. And one of the things that I, I'm, I, I don't think that the proper way to understand two kingdoms gives you this kind of anti-authority, anti-America, anti-type of spirit. That's not the way true two-kingdom Christianity is going to be. And I'm going to really talk about that on Tuesday when I talk about the place of government in our, in our world. So she came, comes um, from that way. So when she left, um, I was there again. She left for, for eight months there to the School of Music uh, and then also then joined me back into, and there she is, with her full uniform on, and be careful. So she is scored expert on grenade throwing. Seriously, she can, do, she can shoot an M16, throw grenades, and even do a Claymore mine. So she looks innocent, but she's, she's uh, I always tell the kids, you be careful, your mother can, uh, can, can throw a grenade a lot better than I can. So it was an amazing experience. It was a time in our life that God worked in us in an amazing way. And then when we were there, 
we then started to, to look at the different things that, that made up who we are. Um, so when she joined, we moved to this little town. I found a picture just this afternoon of Hochspire. Because she joined, we got double housing allowance. We moved to this really nice valley. It's all the pretty trees. But the only thing about that valley that changed us was that you couldn't get television, which was, imagine not getting Wi-Fi, guys. I mean, you know, it was, it was significant. I mean, those over there in this day in, this, in Germany, in Kaiserslautern, we had 71,000 Americans living there. I mean, we had two Mexican restaurants, two Baptist churches. I mean, it was, it was an Americanized city in the, in the 80s back there. And when she moved there, we were able to move into one of these nice little houses, but we didn't get, we didn't get to get any um, uh, uh, television reception. And so for the first time, the first time in my life, the house is quiet. So just, you could try this without Wi-Fi. Imagine what would happen. So the, the, the house was quiet, and for the first time in my life, I started to read. Before this, I hardly read anything. I mean, I think in high school, I might have, you know, tried to skip through, cheat my way through, or whatever, I'm ashamed to say, and then everything. But then finally, we were coming, and we were one day in the PX. The PX was like a, um, a, a military Walmart, and there in the PX was this book, and it was about this thick. Again, I've never hardly read anything, even a comic book. I think when I was younger, I was like attention deficit. I mean, it literally hurt to read comic books. I've never read, read in those days, you know. And there was this big, thick book laying there, and I said, hey, Tanya, I never heard of this guy, Keith Green. Anybody ever read this book? Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, good. And I said, I don't know. I, I just feel like I need to read this book. And she was like, you're not going to read that book. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that thick. It's, there's no way. But hey, go ahead, buy the book. So I read it, I started reading, and I couldn't put it down. I think maybe he was also a musician, and as a musician, um, he, but, but there, if there's anything, it's been th- over 30 years since I've read the book, but if there's anything that got me through reading this book, was that for the first time in my life, I read about a Christianity that was no compromise, I mean, like, my whole life. So, so, like, I had a superficial Christianity. I said the sinner's prayer. I went to the Baptist church. I, I did these types of things. But to have a faith that was everything for Jesus, living my life in a radical way, it was like, I, what do I have that's even called Christianity compared to this? And it was that kind of life that really gripped hold of me. Just It really just, just moved me. So... We were, we were reading that, and, and it began to change us, and we started to say, okay, so how does our life, how is this going to affect our life? Well, remember, we were in that rock band, and that was particularly bad because we, you know, you learn all these, these rock songs and everything, and then we were going to church on Sunday, but then we started to like playing in the bars and stuff. It was fun in the bars that were around there and all that. And that lifestyle just began to drag us further and further down. We did it with the army guys and, and we were there and more and more we realized that we just had a compromising, superficial Christianity. And we were up in a town on a, a military assignment up and in, in, uh, playing for a, a a place in Muchen Gladbach, Germany. It's like northern Germany. And it was a thing called Fasching. Fasching is to the Germans like a, we have for Mardi Gras. It's like before Lent. So before you start Lent, they had this really time of terrible sinning where you would then indulge in the sinning and then you would then go into your Lent time. And we were there playing a concert for that and it was terrible, just absolutely dreadful. And our hearts were being pricked by the, uh, our conscience were being pricked by the Holy Spirit already with our life and our lifestyle. And so finally, there in that hotel room in Mutchen Gladbach, Germany, somewhere around 1988 or 9 or something, uh, we got down on our knees and we said, we're going to give our life over to Jesus Christ. No compromise. No compromise. And it's not like I heard a bunch of rockets going off or anything like that, but if you were to look at our life and say, when did it all start? It would point to that moment 
where we decided to try to live our life believing what the Word of God said. So we started to read the Bible. And as we started to read the Bible, um, you know, different scriptures just be- become to be alive. And the, one of the first things we did was, let's get out of this rock band. So I went to the commander and I said, you know, we're just not wanting to do this rock band thing anymore. Can we get out? And that was easy. There's always people, you know, in line to do a job like that. So then we had our other assignments and everything. But then we'd get excited. We'd get our Bibles and we'd say, okay, well, well, look at this. And, and we'd get, you know, we're this nice young couple and living there, no kids, you know, nothing to do all that. And so we're reading our Bibles and we had over us this banner, no compromise. So if we read it, let's do it. And so it wasn't long, as you can imagine, reading your New Testament. It wasn't long until we come across this. And I got to the Sermon on the Mount. I could take you there like it's yesterday. And Tanya's there, and we're on one of these little arm pillows. I said, I want to read something to you. And I, I just want you to really, really listen. Now, I know you grew up, all you grew up hearing this, but from my world, we never took these scriptures seriously. And most Christians today don't. That's one thing I really want to get across to you. So I started to read from this scripture, and I said, okay, listen to this. Just, just listen. Listen to this, and, and tell me what you think. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That means in the Old Testament, it used to be this way. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take away your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who borrows from you. You have heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Again, that's a good principle. But I tell you, love your enemy enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous if you love those who love you what reward will you get are not even the tax collectors doing that and if you greet only your own people what are you doing more than others do not even the pagans do that and i looked at her and i said so what do you think of that and she is her very matter of fact way says Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I mean, you know, it seems pretty simple stuff. I said, yeah, that's the problem. It is simple. But we're in the army, which really complicates it. Because, remember, no compromise. So we began to look at this and say, well, okay, so wow. So what if Jesus really meant every word he said? And we began to, to ponder that the way that Jesus gave us these teachings were not something... Um, like suggestions. Um, He went over, he went on and said, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men, so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We want to praise God. We want to serve him. So how do we do that? So then as we we pondered our American Christianity and everything that we had, you know, grown, grown up with, we started thinking about the Sermon on the Mount and think about it. Take your Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we started flipping through. I said, wow, so, you know, it talks about that marriage is permanent. It says that we shouldn't engage in lawsuits. It says that we should have these radical uses of our money and that we should seek first the kingdom of God and that we should love our enemies. And I started to think, you know, if we were to take these commands from God about Christianity and do just the opposite. In other words, Jesus commanded us to do these things. Now you go out of your way to do exactly the opposite. We would end up with the modern American church. And that troubled us. So what do we do about this? So we, we pondered this and we, we began to say, okay, well, then we've got we've to do something about this. So I, I then talked to the, the chaplain. I went to talk to the chaplain, and, and I said, okay, I'm having these problems about, you know, reading Jesus and everything. I mean, could you help me? And he gave me a book. It was on the just war theory. It was the first time I ever heard the thought of a just war theory. I said, oh, good. The theologians got this stuff worked out. I'm so glad because 
I mean, you know, I would almost think that we're not supposed to be in the army reading that. And so as I took his book and read this book on the just war theory, I was pretty confident that these theologians would convince me. But when I got to the end of the book, I was more scared. I said, these are the reasons we've been killing people for 2,000 years? And it also introduced me to this whole concept of early Christianity. And it said that the early Christians, the book even mentions, the early Christians were naive. They were childlike. They just took Jesus' teachings and took it very literally. But later on, theologians like Augustine and, and different ones like that gave us a just worth theory that was more robust theologically. I said, that doesn't sound good when Jesus told us that our faith should be like a child. And as I pondered these things, a light bulb came on to me. And, it, and, I, and I want, I'm hoping that it will to you too. This is where I'm going to really stress tomorrow. Jesus is our first principle. He's everything. And his teaching isn't the little side thing that you tack on. And he said the here, he said in Matthew 7, 29, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's not just a little theological thing. He said, even said that he who rejects me and does not receive my words, Jesus' words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last days. The teachings of Jesus were meant for us. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? You know, growing up, uh, it was big in the 80s, uh, this a theological concept called dispensationalism. And in dispensationalism, they kind of had all these charts and everything to put different parts of the scriptures. And a lot of them would even go so far as to put like the book of Matthews like for a different era. So these teachings of Jesus, they would have said, are, are not meant for today. They're meant for heaven or a future place, a future uh, millennial reign or something like that. And I begin to think, oh, wait a minute. So like how hard is it to love your enemies in heaven? You know what I mean? These teachings are not made for heaven. These teachings were given to us for the cure for humanity. And it's not any, any put an exclamation point on them, or, or a question mark, that really then makes it even more strong. So I started reading. <laughs> now, finally, when, when, I, when you read with questions, I, I really encourage you all who are not readers, I was not a reader, but once you start reading with questions, it just then opens up more and more. So I started to read, and I started, we found a bookstore. Now, there was a radical bookstore in town, and that a guy had, and he was a g- radical great guy. He went to church with me, and he bought all these strange books. But he was a bad businessman. He put it in his basement. The whole thing went out of business, and he sold all those books to the local mainline evangelical bookstore in town. So young Tanya and Dean come walking into the bookstore, and I'm looking over there, and I'm f- seeing things, Martyr's Mirror. I'm seeing, seeing things on the early church. I'm seeing things on Minnow Simons. And I hear this word Mennonite. I remember thinking I never, ever heard the word Mennonite in my life. As a matter of fact, when I first heard it, I thought maybe it was like a tribe of Israel, you know, like Midianites and Mennonites or something. I don't know. Never heard it. Uh, I heard of Amish, you know, as we called it, but um, never this. And so as I began to see that actually when I read the early church, when I found out and I, and I was finding myself isolated from from this way of thinking, that I, uh, from the th- other way of thinking of, of, you know, I'm coming out of the way I used to think, that I felt alone, but then I found a companionship in the ancient churches, I kept a companionship in what I was reading. It was significant. I, w- I was starting to share with my, my different friends at, 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 in the unit that we had many Christians there, and I remember one of them saying, Dean, <laughs> You're asking questions that just shouldn't be asked. And I said, well, what do you do with this stuff? I mean, I, I'm, he said, well, Dean, I'm comfortable. And I said, well, I'm, that's it. I'm not comfortable. I remember one time uh, I was, a man um, came and gave, an, uh, he was a Christian in our Baptist church, and he came and gave a, 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 uh, a sermon and he was, I remember him being very upset that he had to be a pilot that was a, uh, a tanker pilot, uh, like a, a refueler or something that would refuel every jet. And how sad he was that he wasn't allowed to be a jet fighter because he, they found out he was a Christian in, in flight school, and so they made him be a, uh, they didn't trust him in, 
to be a, a jet pilot, a fighter pilot. And then he gave us this, this robust, you know, reason of why it's good for us to be involved in war and all that type of thing. And I'm reading the scriptures, I'm reading the early church, I'm reading these things, and I'm saying, wow, I, I just don't see it. So Tanya and I, we went to the, our, our pastor, and we talked to him, and I said, look, I, I love my job. I love America. I love all this, but could you help me? And he just was suddenly very intimidated by it. He says, look, you're not going to change my mind. I said, no, no, I, I want you to change my mind. Explain to me how you can read the G- words of Jesus and, and go bombing people. Can, can you help me with that? And he, he eventually just said, look, Dean, I, I, I think you would be more comfortable worshiping elsewhere. And that began the thing of like, oh, wow, this is starting to have some consequences. It's starting to have some consequences. Our career was really going places. I was made a sergeant, um, different things that we were doing. Tanya was being very involved in the different um, music groups that we were doing. Um, it was, it was, uh, it was a, a, a great time. But then <laughs> we started hearing strange things in the, in the 90s. We started, and growing up in the 80s, you never heard about the Middle East. You never heard about all this stuff going on. It was always the Russians, like it is now. So, um, but then we started hearing about war, and everybody knew what Dean was already talking about. And so they kept looking at me going, I wonder what he's going to do with this. You know, it started building up. Um, also, we all had secondary jobs, at least by the time you're a sergeant, you had secondary jobs. And one of my jobs was an armorer, an armorer. And an armorer is the guys that make sure your machine guns are, are, comfortable, are, are cleaned and you take people out and, and all that type of thing. So I was in charge of the M16s and all that type of a thing. One shipment, I remember going through this, this is an M203 grenade launcher. And so it attaches to the bottom of an M16. And I got a shipment in where I got four of those and I was supposed to connect it to the M16. And I was reading these books and I literally remember holding that M203 grenade launcher in my hand and the M16 in my other hand and, and saying, well, and I, I said, what would Jesus do? But then you know what I did? I, it's, oh, it's, it's so confusing. <laughs> so I continued and I just connected it and attached the M203 grenade launcher to the M16 and finished the job. But God kept working on me more and more. And I began to say, okay, this is just something I, I can't handle anymore. So now this war is starting to get more intense and things are happening. I started telling my friends, like, I'm not comfortable with this at all. I, I'm, I'm having trouble with this. And then finally we had what they called a deadly force briefing. I'll never forget it. <laughs> the uh, acting first sergeant at the time brought us all into this room kind of like this and was, you know, going back and forth in front and and he knew how I was thinking and everything, and he, and he started telling us about what we were going to do to protect this base that we were, you know, in and everything. And he looked at me right and said, and if this or that or the other happened, you're going to have to use deadly force. I said, okay, I, I, this is no longer just a theology. I've got to do something. So this is the 1900s. You know, there's no internet, there's no cell phones, there's no anything. So I had some books by Harold Press, and Tanya and I, we started meeting with another couple, the, these couple here, sorry, Don's on in there, Don and Rick, and we started sharing the Bible with them, meeting with them, having Bible studies with them, and finally they were convicted the same way. We just wrote to Harold Press and said, help, we're four soldiers that don't know what to do, we're going to go AWOL, help, something like that, I wish I would have copied the letter. They quickly sent that from Harold Press to Mennonite Central Committee in Akron, Pennsylvania, who then quickly sent it to some counselors that were living in Germany at the time. That's Andre Stoner um, there. His, ends up that everyone's probably half related. His father is Andre Gingrich uh, and um, Ray Gingrich, thank you, uh, at, from EMU. And so he, they were over there to help people counsel through this type of thing. And so and it was amazing. And so f- uh, finally we then um, started that and... And, and went through, and he was very good at helping us with the, with the regulations. There's another little part of this that really helped to solidify. 
In those days, East and West Berlin were separated. This is the Cold War, you know. So you had East Germany over here, West Germany over there, and even the city of Berlin, like this, was divided in two. And you had to drive through these checkpoints all the way from West Germany to get in there. And I'd gone there twice. When Tanya was in basic training, I went there with my mother, and it was really intimidating. You're there with all this Russian and communist stuff and people looking, you know, all this Cold War machine guns and everything like that. And it's very intimidating. Um, But then when Tanya came back from Germany, I told her about how neat my experience was up there. It's something very different than I'd never seen before. She said, oh, I'd love to see that. So we actually planned a trip, and this is 1989 in November. Does anybody know what happened in 1989 in November? (laughs) The Berlin Wall was coming down, and we were there right then. And it it was such a moment. So right there, you know, what we had before, and now we walk onto the scene when people are literally tearing the Berlin Wall down with our hands. You had to be in a uniform there on the other side, so we were there. So here I am on the top chipping. Later on, I found out there's asbestos in the wall, so if you're ever around a Berlin Wall, don't do this. I, and so we, we did that. My friend was either driving his car into the wall. He broke some trim off. I don't recommend it. And so, But we really got into this whole thing, and it was... It was such a moment. And then Tanya snapped this picture, which is on the cover of our book, Change of Allegiance. And this moment, boy, oh, got me. This East German or Russian, it must have been East German, communist guy, reaches his hand through and screams out, Bruder, Frieden, peace, brother. And, and I went up to him and I shook his hand. And he's looking at me, and I'm looking at the face of the enemy. I mean, in those days, you've got to understand, I mean, the communists were like really the bad guys. But through this hole in the Berlin Wall, and it was like, wow, he's a human. And that moment, man, it, it, it just did. It already took this theological thing and messed with me. So after that night, we started heading back towards uh, West Berlin, and it was the middle of the night. There was this guy there who said he's from the north, Michigan, or something like that. He said, oh, I know how to drive in the snow. I said, man, these flakes are coming down big. Are you sure? No, 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 I got it. So we start heading, you know, into this no man's land and everything, and sure enough, we crash. Crash into a snowbank. We're there, and I'm like, okay, so we are between West and East Berlin, in a no-man's land that's gated off on both sides. It's snowing. It's a blizzard. And there's no lights. There's no cell phones. It didn't exist in those days or any of that. So what are we going to do? So we had, fortunately, we bought some souvenir blankets, and we just sort of covered up. But then in the morning, the enemy began to come over. So in the morning, I finally make it through. And, I mean, you got to understand. I mean, they give us classes. When you go there, you show them this sign. You won't talk to communists or whatever, you know, and, and all this type of a thing. It's a real serious thing. But then in the morning, in the first light, this guy starts coming over, and he seems to be an East German. He comes over and roll down the window a little bit, and you know what he says? You guys okay? Would you like some coffee? <laughs> and I don't know. There was something, again, about my enemy offering me a cup of coffee that messed with me, that messed with me. And one of the things I think that messed with me was I thought, you know, so last year when I was here, I could have, um, I could have shot this guy. I, I could have been called on to kill them. But now just because some leaders in some place make a decision, now suddenly my enemy is my friend, that messed with me. And in this passage, I know it has to do with the Jewish and the, and the Christian, but it had a deeper meaning to me personally through this. Ephesians 2 says, For he himself is our peace. Jesus himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So again, as I began to study and go forward, uh, the early church became alive to me. Um, reading through the early church, I was reading here um, in Tertullian, and like one of this passage says, men of old were used to requiring an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This was a Christian from about the year 150, 180 AD. 
and to repay evil for evil with usury, with interest. But after Christ has supervened and has united the grace of faith with patience, now it is no longer lawful to attack others even with words, nor merely to say fool without danger of the judgment. Christ says, love our enemies and bless your cursors and pray for our persecutors. Justin Martyr, again around the year 150, said this way, we used to be filled with war and mutual slaughter, talking about the Roman people and the philosophers that he was a part of, and every kind of wickedness. However, now all of us have throughout the whole earth, speaking of Christianity around the whole earth, have changed our warlike weapons. We have changed our swords into plowshares, our spears into farming implements. Later he wrote to the emperor trying to explain Christianity, and he said, we who formerly murdered one another now refrain from making war even upon our enemies. And that was the way Christianity was able to explain to the emperors in around 150 AD. Irenaeus said this way, he said, the new covenant that brings back peace and the law that gives life have gone forth over the whole earth. I'm going to hit this tomorrow night with this kingdom concept. As the prophet said, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will re rebuke many people and they will break down their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and they will no longer learn to fight. These people, that is the Christians, form their swords and war lances into plowshares. That is instruments for use for peaceful purposes. So now they are unaccustomed to fighting. When they are struck, they offer the other cheek. Even there's a, uh, from the year 250 even, Hippolytus writing about a, we have this, like a catechism thing or something that who should you baptize, who should you let be baptized into the church. And you weren't even allowed to be baptized. If an applicant or a believer seeks to become a soldier, he must be rejected for he has despised God. This was just part of early Christianity. And why? Well, it's just, it's just, the teachings of Jesus, it's simple, like my brilliant wife said. I'm going to go into more detail with Constantine. But what this happened was then all that for 100, year 200, year 300, then finally different things happened. An emperor claims to be a Christian and unites this Roman Empire and Christianity together and then forms something called Christendom and begins to talk about those things, and, uh, and it changes everything. It was a great time for us. During that time, the, the idea of, of no compromise got to us. Um, it was during that time that we read and started reading about the head covering. Um, we never heard of that. I mean, that was bizarre to us. And my wife would just go grab, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the little ducky... Um, <laughs> Uh, what do you call it, kitchen towel and put it over her head, you know. Uh, but we were trying in everything that we could see in the Bible to just do the permanence of marriage, the, the meeting with the refugees that were there. And it was a, it was a very touching time for us. Um, the one thing that really made it difficult, or, or intense rather, um, that's the other couple that was there. The one thing that really makes it uh, difficult, uh, intense, was you go to several different things. You see a chaplain, you see a psychiatrist. Maybe I'll tell you that story, it's funny. You then go to um, uh, different, get witnesses. You have to write a big paper. And eventually you finally then have to present before a court trial. And as we presented before this court trial, um, it was really intimidating. And each one of us, I had to go separately, Tanya went separately, Rick and Don went separately. And they ask you everything. This is kind of like what we did at the convention with the mock trial and everything. And it's intense. Um, and so as, as you go through that, they're asking me all kinds of things. But there was something about that guy, the officer who was trying us, that starts off kind of superficial. You know, they want to ask you this war and that war, and they ask us all these different things. But then I noticed that the, the, the uh, questions just got more mature. But before that, before we went into the trial, the Mennonite Central Committee actually sent us a little white book. 
And the white book was how to answer the typical questions that they ask in these trials. Remember, what we're trying to do is follow Jesus, right? And so we were together, and we got this little white book. I said, hey, look what we got. Let's read through it. I said, wait a minute. Remember what Jesus said? When you, go, when you are brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is, it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. And we said, you know what, let's just do this. And we threw the book out, we didn't read it, and we said, when they ask us questions, let's just share our heart, share our testimony. Look, I don't know what's going to happen with this recent wars and different things like this. If you're called in or if you're questioned on the job or whatever, don't give the answer, well, this is my church's position, or yeah, we all, you know, this is a time to be real and to talk about your faith. And we did that in the court trial. And he asked us those questions. And it was very intense. It was very intense. And then, if you're, if most of you aren't old enough to remember this, but the first war, that first, excuse me, not war, I'm not that old, the, uh, the uh, first Persian Gulf War was over pretty quick. It came in, and they did it, and it was over. And so we had started this process, gone to that court trial. What he does is he tries us all, writes his suggestions, they listen to all the witnesses, and they sent that somewhere in the Pentagon. And then some guy in the Pentagon or some group in the Pentagon makes a decision, and they send it back to you. This took eight months. So the war was over. Uh, and during that time, we, were, we had all these weird jobs. I, I, we, I could no longer keep singing the patriotic songs, and I asked to be released from that, and that was pretty severe. Um, and we had all these different random jobs, had to do guard duty at separate times, me with my friend's wife and him with Tanya, and just to kind of mess with us. And, but during all that time, we studied the Word of God, we studied early Christianity, we studied the Anabaptist history and all that, and it was a really good time for us. But now the war is over. I'm almost done. Now the war is over. And finally, we're kind of wondering what's going to happen, and finally the day comes when the commander says, hey, Dean, your, your results are in. And that officer, same officer, wants to speak to you up, upstairs. I said, okay. So we gathered the other two, or other... Tanya and I and the other two, and we went up there. And I remember right before we went up the steps, the first acting first sergeant said, um, so what are you going to do if they say no? I said, well, I don't know. I guess we'll go to jail. I, you know, we've made our decisions. We're, we're going to walk in this. And so as we did, we, we went up there, and the same little office, or right next door, the same little office that we originally asked for conscience objector, that same place where... Your life starts changing. Now you're in this little bitty office, and he had four manila envelopes laying on the, the desk, and he pointed to him and he said, now, I, I have your results for the conscience objectors. I have your results here. I'm like, okay, you know, you're here there. Yes, sir, here reporting, you know, and he says, okay, I have your results. And he said, but, he said, but wait, he said, um, the war's over. You guys have a great assignment. You have a great job. I have the authority to just forget about this. And you can go about your job, and we can just, we can just get past it. The war's over. You can finish your time, and, and everything will be fine. In my mind, I'm thinking, uh-oh, he's trying to, trying to help me out. He's trying to be a nice guy, right? And I said, well, I looked over to Tanya and to the other two, and I said, no, I, I, sir, I, I think they all gave me the nod of not interested so no, sir, we, we feel that we, we want to go forward no matter what the consequences, we, we want to go forward with this. He said, well, that's what I thought you'd say. He said, well, I want to tell you, you've all been approved for conscious objector discharge. So, you know, we kind of, amen, we kind of celebrated in you know, an army kind of way, you know. But then one of the most shocking moments in my life came. It's one of those slow motion moments. And he said, but, he said, hey, but, but wait, he said, there's, there's something I, I need to tell you. He said, I too now am getting out of the army for the very same reason. <laughs> Amazing. I, I, well, it was hard to believe. So he, we were given like just a few days to get out of the country. We did uh, ask for an extension and we got to longer. We, were, we were just couldn't believe in this idea that the very guy that tried us 
We, and, uh, we, we tried to go find that guy. He was an officer. We were not. We couldn't get to him. We were trying to say, well, let's talk to this guy. But the thing that got me about that is I ponder and I can't shake that feeling that when he tells me he's getting out of the army for the same reason, it's this. Do You know in Matthew 13 where Jesus talks about these, these analogies about the kingdom of God. They're like yeast. They're like a mustard seed. And the idea that they start off small, but they expand. The kingdom of God is like this. If we really believe that Jesus meant every word he said, it changes your life. It's not just a theological thing anymore. It's not just a faith that is um, just a bunch of theological ideas. It has theological ideas, amen, but it also has a blueprint for humanity. It changes your life. And when you get that, and when somebody takes it seriously, and they said, you know, I believe Jesus meant every word he said, and I want to live that out, it's it's contagious. And so I'm going to encourage you through uh, these three sessions for tonight and the next three sessions that are coming to ponder Jesus as a blueprint for humanity, as a Savior, as as God, and allow that to be that. And if you let tonight even, if you let that seed in you, it'll grow. I promise you it'll grow. And so through this, if, if tonight, if you have never truly come to Christ, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is the answer and that he wants to save you from your sins. He wants to save you from uh, a life of futility And he wants to to cleanse you and also save you for activity in the kingdom of God. He wants to enlist you into the soldiers and soldiers of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to take Jesus seriously tonight. So let's pray, and I'm going to hand it back over to Javen and um, ask God to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your words. I thank you for your blueprint. I thank you for all the grace you have given to me and my family. I thank you, Lord, and I do ask you to be, every, to be with every one of us tonight and let those seeds of the kingdom of God be in us and every one of us and be here also at, at this church at Sharon, Lord, and I pray make this truly a beacon on a hill in a time when this country is going crazy. I pray that they would truly be the salt of the earth and be an example and give glory to God. I pray your blessings upon them. And Lord, please be with the rest of this, of this week uh, and also uh, help me with all those different things that you would be glorified in all that it said. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 That's powerful. Thank you, Dean, for sharing this evening. He had one picture up there that really got my attention. And I literally didn't put the dots together until this evening. And I can take you back to where I was when I first saw that man shaking that guy's hand through that wall. That's powerful. And to know that um, Dean was the one that was there. That's powerful. What does it mean to really love our enemies? Back to that question that he asked. What if Jesus meant every word he said? His words are simple yet profound. Have we been fed this evening? Trust we have. There's a snack prepared for everyone afterwards here so we can fellowship. And I'd like to open it here. And does anybody have any questions for Dean? I'm sure afterwards we'll all want to talk to him. Hey, what about this? What about that? I'll just pause here for a minute and um, maybe, Dean, you can respond where you're at or you can come up here. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask him or Tanya? Yeah, really encourage you to stay in chat. Uh, just 
these things that are hard questions, and, and they're okay to ask them. Well, it was very. Can everybody hear that? Dean, can you turn your mic on and, and, and just speak, yes. speak yeah. into that? No, no. Okay. Well, it's your dad. Um, so she's saying, my, I, I saw my dad cry twice in his life, and it was very serious to him. I mean, once was when he told me his father died in a car accident, and the other was when I announced that Tanya and I were becoming conscious objectors. Um, he just swept. And uh, it took years. Uh, I mean, still, I think it's a sore spot. Um, but, um, yeah. It was very hard. We've worked through that. I mean, it's there. There's still her, her mother lives with us, and she's a very spiritual woman, uh, very praying woman. We love that, but this this is still a, a a place of not agreement, and it's it's hard sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Good Interesting question. to know that because the relationship that I've seen with your mom does not portray that. It's part. been a miracle, really. Yes. Yeah, amen. It's really been a miracle. I think where Jesus is, you know. You know, he brings us to an ability to just say, it's okay. We see through a glass darkly, but then we ha have salt within ourselves Amen. and peace with one another. You know, we should both keep our salt. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm trying to think if I'll bring that into another. Uh, I'll r remind me and I'll tell you to 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 get it into the message. I think it could fit. Yeah, I, it'll either fit to, uh, tonight or stay tuned, and that <laughs> and we'll, we'll get that one in. It's kind of a funny story of all the the people that I had we had to go to. That one was the most uh, what do you call it antagonistic. So yeah. Anybody else? I was reminded of this quote by Charles Spurgeon. Um, he said this, he said, unless we are instructive preachers and really feed the people, we may be great quoters of elegant poetry and mighty ret retailers of secondhand windbags, but we shall be like Nero of old, fiddling with Rome, fiddling with Rome what was still burning and sending vessels to Alexandria to fetch sand for the arena when the population starved for want of corn. I was reminded of that when he had pictures of the Roman arena there. And I trust we've been fed this evening by God's word in a new way. So shall we stand and have closing prayer and then we'll ask the blessing on the snack for uh, afterwards. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your words that you have in your word, God, that we can truly take the words that you spoke and we can use them as a map, use them as a guide, use them as a compass for our Christian lifestyle each day. God, we just ask a special blessing upon Dean as he continues to, as we anticipate to share on the two kingdom concept and what that truly looks like in the world that we live in today, God. Father, just um, thank you for each one that is here. Ask you just might bless them. Bless the, the food that has been prepared, the snack. Ask you we just might use it for your honor and your glory and your kingdom. Just go before us this evening. We just ask this in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen.